Brother will hand over brother to death, and the father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. And so what Jesus is saying, what is put into the mouth of Jesus anyway, um, is that what's going on right now for you? What's going on in Rome? Your brothers against brothers, fathers against sons. What's that betrayal that's going on? Um, is Jesus predicted that for you? you know, and because your name is Christian, uh, in the Roman world, you know, they blame the Christians for this great fire. Because you are a Christian, you will be persecuted. And so Jesus has that, um, Mark writes that Jesus has this prediction here. And so we see that going on in the, the text there. Another thing that we can look at is how, in particular, Peter and Judas um, interact with Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, both betray Jesus. Judas and Peter are on the same level in this Gospel of Mark. Now, if you know, a lot of you are familiar with Peter, St. Peter, he's supposed to be up at the pearly gates. He's supposed to be the first bishop of Rome. You know, he, he's this great guy that started the church. But he's on the same level as Judas in this Gospel. And so... Um, we see in the gospel that Peter just bursts into tears and then disappears from the gospel after he denies Jesus. The same thing happens with Judas. After he betrays Jesus, he just disappears from the gospel. And so if you think about the context in which the, Romans, the Roman Christians were at, they knew that Peter was this great founder of the church. They knew that Peter was this great guy and that he was, you know, um, preaching the gospel, and he was the one who came to Rome and sort of helped them get their start. Um, and so we can ask ourselves, what is Mark saying then? If you know this particular context, if you know that Peter, even though he's betrayed Jesus and just disappears, has started the church, what is Mark maybe saying about some of the Christians that have betrayed each other in Rome, um, some of the persecutions that are going on in Rome. You know, we can sort of guess maybe what was in the mind of Mark at this point. And so we can sort of draw conclusions now. Now these may or may not be right, but they're conclusions that, you know, based on this uh, narrative criticism that we've done, based on this historical criticism that we've done, bringing all these different things together, we can look to see and draw a conclusion. Now, the first thing uh, that we need to realize is that this gospel motif is a new, brand new motif. Um, it is, you know, the gospel of Mark was the first style, first type of gospel or first um, style of the gospel text that we have. And so this is a new way in which they're proclaiming the good news. This is a new way in which we, the, um, the Christians of the, at this time were able to receive the, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so for the Roman Christians, they needed a way in this new motif, in this new gospel structure of making sense of the persecution and upheaval. And we can sort of draw conclusions from that, but for sure, sure we know that they needed to make sense of that persecution and upheaval. And they needed to come to terms with apostates. And all apostate means is this someone who has denied Jesus, someone who has denied the faith. Um, they need to come to terms with apostates and if they want to come back into the Christian sect. Um, later on, there's a huge, huge division um, in the church about this particular reason um, where people were denying the Christians during denying themselves as Christians during persecution, and they wanted to come back, and some people said, no, they can't come back. Some people said, yes, they can. So there's a huge, huge dilemma within the church, even later on, as the persecutions continued. And then also, they needed to overcome the betrayals. Um, they needed to overcome, sort of, you know, people betraying them. Uh, 
the Christians betraying each other. So they needed a way for that. And the Gospel of Mark looks at that. The Gospel of Mark um, informs those Roman Christians and helps them come to terms with those dilemmas that they've got. Now, one other thing that will help us um, sort of look at the disciples and how this is helping us, where the Gospel of Mark leaves us off at, um, if you look at the last part of your Gospel there, the last part of Mark, um, verses, what is it, 16, 9 through 20, it's like um, you can choose your own ending for the Gospel of Mark. It's got a long ending, it's got a short ending. Um, both of the endings were added centuries later. Um, and the reason that they were added is to sort of soften the portrayal of the disciples in the text. Because when we look at the text where it ends off at, we've got the women running away scared from the empty tomb, not doing what Jesus says. So we've got disciples, again, not doing what Jesus tells them to do. And so um, that even makes it a stronger argument for this sort of you know, betrayal of Jesus and what can happen. That even though these, these disciples that were with Jesus, they were able to you know, get over that and become you know, these great founders of the church. They were able to um, come back and make this great church that these Roman Christians were a part of. And so... Um, just here as we do some textual criticism, you know, how do you figure out whether or not these endings that we've got actually fit in? Well, one of the things is the Greek doesn't match in the manuscripts. The style of writing that you've got just doesn't match. And so that's one clue that we can have that this particular ending doesn't go along with Mark. Um, and now that we're finding more and more manuscripts, early manuscripts, like from the Dead Sea Scrolls, actually not the Dead Sea Scrolls, I'm sorry, but manuscripts, early manuscripts from early Christian um, sects, uh, none, of the, and none of those endings are found in those earliest texts. And so that's a big clue that um, that wasn't an ending there. And it lets the disciples off easy. So it doesn't follow the mo motif of discipleship that we have in the Gospel of Mark. And so it doesn't fit with the story, it doesn't fit with the theme. And also, it does not fit with the chiastic structure that you've got. The last verses that you've got in the original ending, where the um, women are leaving and fleeing the, the empty tomb, they tie up very well with the beginning of the gospel and how that goes. And actually, um, one of your discussion questions there is, um, with this new ending, how do you explain you know, what is going on um, why would the Gospel of Mark leave, leave you at this point with women just fleeing? There's, no, um, there's just an empty tomb. There's no ascension. There's no uh, sightings of Jesus that you've got. You know, why would the Gospel of Mark do that? And if you look at the beginning, if we follow that chiastic structure, it so will help us answer that question. And so here are the works that I had. So thank you very much and enjoy the Gospel of Mark. <laughs>